just so that uh, Peter and anyone else in the public, I guess they're not here for this. So, so this is for Peter. I put in the chat here a link to the um, Google Drive folder where you can look at the economic development plan that we're working on. Um, so I told you I would get you that. And Mike, it, these these working documents isn't there isn't there a way for the public to look at them read only on the city website? Yeah, I have to send the invite. I was trying to get my other computer to get there. And uh, so you know, Peter, uh, that link will send you to all of the documents related to what we're working on now, but the. The one that's the spreadsheet that's revised PC template, I believe that is the most up to date version of what we're working on. So, revised PC template, that file. Okay, well, let's call this meeting to order. Uh, first thing we have to do is approve the agenda. So, I'll take a motion when people are ready. I move approval of the agenda. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Second from John. So motion to approve by Arian, second by John. Those in favor of approving the agenda say aye. 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 Okay, agenda approved. Um, comments from the chair. I don't uh, have anything specific. Um, you know, we have a number of small things to, uh, to go through tonight, though, updates and so forth. Um, so that's it for me. Does anyone else have anything that's not on the agenda? Any planning commissioners that they want to make us aware of or anything? OK. Um, general business from the public. So usually you know this is this is if if there's anyone from the public who has anything to talk about that's not on the agenda uh they could talk now my understanding mr kelman is that you want to talk about things that are on the agenda right uh yes but i did want to uh, talk just briefly about set the stage for that which is not on the agenda um yeah sure sure so like just to let you know like like where where my mind is on this is you know we'll be having a discussion of these topics as they come up and i'd love just to include you on those discussions as it comes up so um you know you you won't you won't not have a chance later just to let you know but if, no, but if I, there's something that's on the agenda go ahead yeah yeah so i i just like to establish a context for any later remarks that i might uh make uh, of course i want to listen to um, and just by describing in sort of abbreviated form uh, the housing crisis uh, Montpelier is facing today, which I could skip if all of you had read it, but I don't think you have, right? It wasn't distributed, was it? Yes. It, it was yeah. distributed. I read it. Oh, I read okay. it. I read it before too, Peter, but I read your amended one. Uh, Gabe, I sent that to you. Right, and then it was distributed by Mike over the weekend. Oh, was well, everybody got it? Everybody got it. Oh, okay. Well, then I then I I, I will say no more. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to I want to pull it up. Um, I, I I it's basically I, I bulleted fourteen types of or aspects of uh, the high housing crisis. Right, they're bulleted. I think you described the problem very well. I, I liked it. I thought it was a good summary of issues that we're facing. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I'll, then I'll wait until uh, the particular items come up. Uh, I'll just say one thing, which is that um, my proposal to um, uh, create a permanent housing committee, uh, I presented that proposal to the housing task force because it would involve them uh, ceasing to exist. And they actually voted unanimously to make that proposal to the city council, which I think they're going to do in the next at the next meeting and the meeting after. 
to phase out or to end the housing task force, and replace it with a permanent standing committee appointed in the usual way by the uh, city council. Um, so uh, I just just let you know that because that's not on the agenda. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll I'll chip in as you guys get to the items in the agenda. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for and thanks for letting us know about that. Um, I wasn't I wasn't aware of the city council doing that in the near future. Um, it hasn't okay. Been, well, it hasn't been presented to them yet. This okay. the housing task force will be presenting it to them. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, and it sounds like a good idea. I think it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have a number of updates from Mike and uh, there's four things and we're just gonna go through that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it off to Mike to start with the updates. Um, the first one being the community development specialist. All right, so I'll also throw out one, add one more in real quick, just to let you guys know, if you, if you aren't aware that there is gonna be an Elks Club public forum tomorrow, um, so it's the, the Elks Club property. There was a bond passed. So there's going to be a public input session on that. That will be tomorrow. Um, so if you don't have that, you can look at the city website and get a link to it. It will be on the Zoom platform. Um, yeah. Do you know what time it is, Mike? 6.30. If you, uh, and I know Ann Watson posted on Facebook um, a link to it. Um, I had reached out to her and told her about how we were talking about how the space could be used for childcare. And that was something that, that we liked. So Anne's aware of that. All right. So the, the first item on the updates was the, the community and economic development specialist position. Um, I can't go into a lot of the details, but I will go and say we, we did post that we had six excellent candidates apply. Um, it's a remarkable set of candidates. Every single one of them had a master's degree or more. So it was a really good, really good selection. We just completed interviews uh, an hour ago. So we will be um, meeting tomorrow to, to go through and um, make that next step of inviting in for second interviews. The first one was by Zoom. So the second one will bring in candidates. So Hopefully, we will have uh, Kevin's position refilled in the next, um, within the next uh, couple weeks. Mike, for those of us who uh, weren't here when Kevin was here, can you just describe how that role will interface with uh, our planning commission? So he doesn't, um, so Kevin is actually still here. Most of the committees that Kevin um is staff for, he's staff for the Public Art Commission, he's staff for the Housing Task Force and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. So he, he fills those three, those three roles. Um, so a lot of what he does is working more directly with the housing folks. So he will, he works with me in developing some of our housing strategies that you have in the housing section um, but he obviously has worked in a number of other other places as well. Um, so we'll see um, for the new person when they when they get hired and get on board. Those will probably be the three committees they'll be working on as well. Thank you. And is, is the position full time now or part time? Yes, it is full time. Okay. Yeah, good. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin went to point eight for a time because of uh just family stuff um so he he rolled back his time for a little bit but he's back to full time now or the new person will be full time uh so the next thing i just wanted to mention uh was the rfp for hiring a consultant to help with the online plan so hold on a second hold on a second mike uh, yeah. uh, i think peter has something to say about the first item yeah. Um, so since you guys have read what I wrote, you know that I uh, uh, strongly uh, be I believe and I've recommended to Mike uh, uh, that this person be dedicated to housing, that having this person have to deal with economic development uh, is 
just not not the right thing to do at this time. Housing is such a huge, overwhelming issue, um, and I just don't think that chasing down uh, uh, people, uh, you know, more businesses or helping out the downtown is what we need at this time. And let me just add that now that a modest majority, 54% of Montpelier voters have approved the bond to purchase the former Elks Club property, the city is going to have an unprecedented opportunity and an enormous planning and public communication challenge that could have a greater impact on the future of Montpelier than any government program, project, or regulation that has been considered, I would say, in the last century. This critically important and huge, for Montpelier anyway, project is going to require the leadership and on-the-ground implementation efforts of city staff who possess a very wide range of skills, including the ability to bring together and work with private and public sector organizations that will be needed to plan, design, and implement such a large and complex project. And moreover, this staff must have a strong moral compass and the interpersonal skills to affirmatively engage and genuinely involve the widest possible range of residents, taxpayers, and spokespersons for underrepresented groups in the planning and implementation of this project so that it serves all Montpelier residents. And I, surely a dedicated housing uh, development specialist has to be part of such an effort and not be distracted by broader economic development issues. I feel very strongly about that, as you can tell. And I have to say that both of these requirements that I mentioned, both to be able to work with all of these different groups, bring them together, there's already so much bad feeling. This just 54% approved. That means 46% didn't approve this. Okay, we've got a, a, a public relations issue, and it's not one that is just you know, going to be fixed by messaging. It's one that really requires some genuine work with the community. And I can tell you from personal experience that Kevin did not do that. And it's going to be very important to have someone who will do that, who will engage people in the community, not keep them away from the prospective developers. Thank you. So, so Mike, a uh, follow-up question I would have on that is um, the candidates that you've interviewed, do, do, you, do we have people with um, strong backgrounds in uh, like public outreach? Yeah, I mean, without getting into details of, of people's uh, resumes, yeah, I mean, these were all, all very good, excellent candidates. Um, you know, any, any one of the six could fill this position. So um, we think we've got a great person um, lined up we'll have a conversation tomorrow about um taking those next steps but just so everybody understands in, uh, how our form of government works um you guys are uh, you know the planning commission and you guys work to provide recommendations to city council city council then hires a city manager who then runs, we're a city manager form of government and the city manager then goes and assigns and directs the staff. So, you know, I, I work with you guys and uh, you know, the, the point of everything is for us to all be working collaboratively and cooperatively. And I think we've, we've been doing that very well, but officially I work for Bill, um, you know, I'm not working for you guys and I think you guys know that. And so when it comes to staffing, when it comes to making decisions of personnel and, and how we title things, um, that's, that's under my direction. And, you know, housing specialist is, not, is a different job. Um, if you were to see that advertised in a position, that's a different, completely different job than what I'm offering here. And a community development specialist is actually what this position is, a community and economic development specialist. And, the reason that that got rolled back in economic development got rolled back into the title was because we had done an economic development strategic plan and created a uh, Montpelier Development Corp. And when that dissolved, those functions have returned back to the city and they've returned back to my department. And therefore, um, Bill thought it was prudent to put that in the title. Now, how much does that change the actual job that um, Kevin was doing? Is It doesn't actually change it. A, great deal. Um, we, 
need to make sure that our positions are, are broad and flexible enough to adjust with what is going on. And uh, I'm very comfortable with the job description, very comfortable with the name. It's not changing. It is going to be the Community and Economic Development Specialist. And things change over time. I mean, the role that uh, Kevin played over eight years, well, he's been here 10, uh, worked for me for eight, was, uh, you know, he, he worked with uh, getting downtown grants to build sidewalks. He worked with the uh, public works and really it depended a lot on what was going on. And we need the flexibility to have our staff be responsive. Uh, when Brownfields became a significant issue for the transit center, Kevin went out and pursued and got a million dollars in grants to help clean up that brownfield. Um, and when uh, we had other projects that were coming along, those were the things that this position really works on. Um, so I've always I've talked and you guys have heard this spiel before. We talk about having our, our five ways that we implement plans um, and we have people that work on the regulations and the permits. Kevin's position works on these projects and works on these programs. Um, and we have opportunities to do more. Kevin took this position a long way from when I originally got here. And he has made, uh, worked through a number of projects over his years um, to get stuff going. We're at a new opportunity and I'm, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm sorry to see Kevin go, but I think we're going to have uh, hopefully a great person that's going to come back in and bring new skills and new ideas that we can can move forward on. But at the same time, we can't pigeonhole this person to only housing um, just because that's not how our government works. It's not how our office works. Um, we're going to have people that come in and, you know, does is there going to be a lot of time spent? You know, we don't recruit businesses, but if somebody comes in our office and says, I'm interested in bringing a business to Montpelier. Um, you know, what opportunities, what programs do you have to help us? And we're talking about our economic plan. You know, we've been talking about the past few meetings. We'll be talking again later. These are the programs that the community and economic development specialist would be addressing. If somebody comes in and wants a tax stabilization, this person explains what we can offer, what the TIF can offer. Um, and, and those those types of things. And it doesn't take away from the fact that there's going to be a majority of the effort is going to be tied to um, housing because that is has always been the primary focus of the community. Uh, when it was the community development specialist, that was their primary focus was uh, revolving loan funds, housing projects, working with Downstreet, working with um, Evernorth, which was housing Vermont. Um, that that was has always been a focus, and that'll continue to be a focus. But there's time and room for people to be working on other other projects throughout this. So I guess that would be my my comments on on that matter. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mike. And, and and just as a clarification, I hope you didn't have the impression that we were trying to like have any kind of oversight over the hiring process. I, got, I don't think you think that, no. but I just want to clarify that that that's not what we're interested in doing. Um, Gabe, do you have something? Oh, uh, yeah, just just curious. Um, so, who's would it be this the this person's role, or whose role would it be to whenever you know final plans are made for you know it is as Peter raised, I and mean, it's pretty tremendous opportunity and challenge. Uh, whatever's going to happen at the at the old golf course, right? Who who is the project manager? Is that this role? Is that what, who would do that, or who, who would do that? Right now, this posi the the, um, the the country club is in uh, Cameron, the assistant city manager. She's the one who's running the project right now, and they're bringing me in. Um, I believe on the thirteenth, maybe I want to say it's the April thirteenth council meeting. I'll be making a presentation to council on how municipalities do large scale projects. So I'm going to be start to be brought in on how we go through a process because uh, although we, I haven't done very many projects here in Montpelier, I did a lot of projects in Berry City and we try to work them in the same way where we, I, I have this plan, prepare, implement, um, break it into three big steps. Uh, transportation planners break them into like five or seven steps. Um, but 
we really want to focus the first year on on planning and so that's what we're going to be doing getting a conceptual plan and i'll go through a lot of these steps and explain why it's important how it's helpful um, so i'm going to be slowly brought in to help with the planning side i'm not going to be really carrying a lot of the weight on that we'll bring in a consultant to help to, to do that that's our plan right now um, is to bring in a consultant who can manage the process for two reasons one is um, we want to make sure the public can can interact with a with a kind of a third party um, you know we're not um, if, if we do the presentation that's why tomorrow night's presentation is being hosted by uh, Paul Costello so um, he's just going to facilitate it and and so we want to start to make sure while we're you know we are as staff running the project we can kind of start bringing consultants to help to to facilitate the process because we need both the facilitation as well as somebody who can then direct the the, the site investigations because we obviously have to know where the wetlands are where the you know prime ag soils all the pieces that are going to go into any future act 250 permit that we expect we're going to need to get so we start doing some homework so we can do that that process so i'm going to be start to be brought in when we get to next year so as we start getting into those next preparing and implementing steps the community and economic development specialist is going to be much more involved in that process and especially when we get to implementing because our our idea at this point is we expect at some point there's going to be some housing some recreation some open space the question is the balance and what it looks like but eventually we're not going to be building anything from a housing standpoint so at a certain point as it gets to um, let's say we, we, we've got a proposal that's going to subdivide, you know, 14 lots for multifamily housing. And then we're going to have other lots that are going to be subdivided for single family or other units. So somebody has to, you know, get in the business of, of connecting if, if the decision is make this affordable housing. Well, somebody's got to reach out to our partners and see what, what our partners are willing to do, what their timing is in order to, to start moving these forward. And so over time so really it's going to start with cameron it's going to move a little bit to me then it's going to move eventually to the economic specialist to to start rolling this out thanks mike sounds like a couple of meetings to attend huh thank you oh, yeah i've got i've got a lot a lot of meetings i'll be presenting at coming up okay does anybody have anything else on community development specialists before we move on to the rfp for the consultant for the online plan. Okay, thanks for the update, Mike. That seems right. uh, seems great. Yeah, it's good news. Um, so really quick, the RFP that that was released, um, sent out to VPA, and then actually got onto the GIS listserv as well, uh, which actually has turned out to be a remarkable resource for this because I'm getting bombarded with people who want the RFP. So. Um, I think this is going to end up, we're going to end up with a lot of folks who are interested. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, our plan is to build out our city plan in um, GIS, ArcGIS, in, into storyboard format. So instead of having a printed document, we're actually, you know, we'll probably have to have a printed document somewhere. But the idea is that this would be mostly an online document with storyboards and very graphically rich. And so we need to have a consultant who is familiar with that and familiar with how to not only how to lay that out but what's the best way to convey messages in that format and so um, we've got money set aside that was in we didn't get any grants we had applied for a bunch didn't get any grants but the city council just put uh, twenty thousand dollars in the budget so we can hire somebody and just do it with our own money so um, hopefully that hopefully we get some good that'll the that RFP is due April 4th so we'll see how many people respond to it and what what we get and I will probably bring you guys in on the you know um, on the process and I don't know if there's uh, somebody one or two of you who want to review the proposals with me I'd certainly invite anyone who wants to kind of participate in that um, but I'd like to bring it to you guys to recommend to, to make the final decision on who we hire or Make the final decision on who we recommend to council to hire. Um, so, John, maybe. I can volunteer to review some of those since it's a world I think I know fairly well. 
I would definitely appreciate that because mm -hmm. I know remarkably little about it. <laughs> Thank you, John. Are there, uh, I guess people can think about this, but yeah, other planning commissioners, if you are interested, let us know. Um, I can, I can, I, I can help uh, Mike, but if there's other people. Yeah, it's just a matter of probably scoring them. It'll be scoring them so we can get a, a small sample to interview with you guys, the Planning Commission, in April. So that would be the, the plan. Um, and we'll see how much work it is, depending on how many applications we get. Okay. Uh, yeah, Peter, do you have something to say about this? Mike, I have a question. Um, is this going to be uh, something that, how is this going to be accessed by the public? Will it be through the city website, or will there be a will it be its own uh, application? It'll link. To, there'll be a link on the city website um, to to the basically it would be the the hub with the storyboards. So there would be a direct link from the main page. Will, will there be any way for people to get to it directly without going through the city website? Yeah. Yeah, that always works that way. If somebody were to Google Montpelier City Plan, it would pop up with a direct link to it. Okay, because that's pretty important. The city website at this point is a jungle. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah really, there's a, there's a, very a grant to replace that too. No, I know. Well, it, it, apparently it's to repair it. But the problem is, it, it's it's for one thing, it's got a search engine that is just awful. You You can't find any, it's very hard to find things. Um, okay, well, I, 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 I have a concern about this from, an, from a, that means this is only going to be accessible by people who are somewhat computer literate. So I think that you need to figure out ways to get this out to the public so the public really knows how, how they can get to it in a friendly way, not just to get it up there. I mean, the, the city council had this incredible equity report that was done in August. It's sitting buried somewhere in the, uh, in, 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 uh, on the website. Nobody, nobody, none, nobody from the public is aware of it. That's a good point. I mean, it will be important to make sure that it comes up in a Google search, but I'm, I'm assuming a consultant could help with that. And promote it, and promote it. It's got it's. It, there should be a press release. It should be, you know, on oh, public yeah. forum. No, I mean, really get people. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah, we want to do that. I mean, we we definitely we want to sh when this thing's done, we want to show it off. Um, so we'll be doing that. And we're also uh, just so you're aware, Peter. Uh, we're in the process of of reaching out to the public again about the um, proposed zoning changes. That we've that we passed out to Swinton City Council too. That's we've been trying to get the word out about that as as well. Um, Actually, I, Kirby, I that's a, I'm glad you mentioned that. W weren't you guys impressed by how many people showed up in that Zoom meeting for for, for the, uh, the the proposed changes? Right. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah, no, that lot. that that's that's one of the silver linings of the pandemic. Zoom has enabled many more people to actually uh, engage. And I think it's something we should remember as we get back to non-pandemic life. Let's keep up the Zoom. Uh, uh, I, I mean, because people will come to things if they don't have to drive downtown and put money in a meter and so forth. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah, we're not in a we're not in a hurry to change, really. Um, okay, so what's the next what's the next item? Uh, Just a reminder: yeah. the city council ahead, hearing. Mike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ahead, so Mike. that's. Uh, city council hearing is next Wednesday, eight days, 10 days from now. Um, so just letting people know that that'll be going in. Letters have gone out to the, the Sabin, Sabins abutters. So that's all been taken care of. So um, hopefully I'll be getting a presentation ready for that. Hopefully that rolls out um, pretty smoothly. There'll be two, at least two. There's uh, one now and one on the, or one next week on the 23rd and then April 13th. And there can be any number after that, depending on what city council wants to do. See, I'll, I'll be there, Mike, um, in case they want to hear directly from planning commission on, on any of the items. Um, anybody else who wants to come, go for it. 
All right. And then the last thing, and I don't know if we want to have um, more of a discussion on this one here, but I did put, throw in there at the last second the um, AARP Congress of New Urbanism memo that we did receive last week. Um, so we did get that in finally. Um, there are some some items I think that are, are good suggestions that they have in here. Some of them I think uh, a little bit or is a misunderstanding on their part and I think a little bit miss, misses the point on a couple others. But um, I think there are different ideas that we can talk about over time with that one. And so I'll let you guys decide whether or not you guys want to get into that or just so you guys know you guys got a copy of it. Yeah, I think I think what we'll do is we'll circle back to it uh, whenever there's a lull in the city plan stuff. I think I think it's probably good that we continue to prioritize the city plan. But the issues that they drew attention to, I think, are things we should revisit and go through one at a time. Um, and depending on what happens with the zoning changes, there might, there might need to be some follow up either related to the density cap stuff if it does happen or doesn't happen and then if it does happen the design review follow-up that we all know is needed so i think all that stuff's connected and we can, we can all revisit it when we don't have city plan work to do yeah. does that sound good to everybody yeah go ahead peter all right, this is the last thing I'm going to say, and I'll let you get to your work. I, 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 I did read the memo, um, and I, I just, uh, I, I share, I, I agree with Mike, what he said. And I I'd really caution the commission that while some of these fixes may be necessary, they're unlikely to be sufficient to significantly, re quote, reduce barriers to infill development and conversion of existing buildings multi-unit occupancy by Montpelier home and property owners. I've added that. There are a number of considerably more challenging structural barriers than the memo identifies, including costs of construction that are too high to be financially justifiable for individual homeowners. The apparently limited capacity of city staff to provide the kind of guidance individual homeowners may need for such projects the power of NIMBY neighbors to gum up almost any construction that has any exterior element, as some of us here are painfully aware, and the potential for any set of regulations, our current ones, the AARP suggested changes, to have unintended outcomes that favor large scale developers over individual homeowners. And in my opinion, and Mike and I have argued about this in the past, I'm gonna say it though, in order for Montpelier to address these and other structural barriers to infill development, et cetera, by homeowners, Montpelier needs to have an appropriately staffed city housing program that provides the zoning guidance, the technical support, and financial incentives needed to help individual homeowners to cost effectively renovate their older, less energy efficient homes in ways that will increase available and affordable living units. This is a much more efficient way than built than new construction. But Mike, you hear, you've heard what Mike said. We're not in this business. That's not what we do. Well, I think that is what we should do. And if it's not gonna be done by Mike's department, we need a department that will do that. We need someone who is going to handhold uh, homeowners to be able to do this. We passed ADUs, we passed, I can't remember what the program was six years ago, and very few people do it because it's just too hard. There's too much to do. They need handholding. Well, okay, so um, I don't think that my comments before were saying that his office is off the hook for that. He was just saying that one position is, you know, no, does no, housing. Mike and, I, Mike and I have but, argued about this in the past. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to 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 kind of reconcile some things, though, we are we are, you know, working the city plan now. We're working on a new housing chapter with new goals and strategies. So my question is actually to like, Mike, do you feel like the state of the uh, of the housing chapter where we have it now, like this will be the future housing chapter, Peter? Uh, do you feel like it addresses the things that he was just raising? Because, I mean, I feel like we tried to do that. 
but if there's if there's missing pieces if there's something we can do to bolster what we've already done with that housing chapter it's not too late well i think we've got a lot in there um so we've focused on a few places one of which was to to do some training within the um within the developer community to try to do some of those boot camps and some of those ideas which i i think one of the issues we have is just not enough people who are developers as well to do the work um but i disagree with with peter's assessment that we're not there and uh, you know a few of you may have applied for permits before um meredith and and audra you pretty much you don't have to know anything about the zoning you just have to walk in and tell them what you want to do and they will walk you right through the process of getting a permit um, there is a ton of hand holding now we don't go out and pound the nails for you but we're going to be there and when it gets to chris chris lumber who's the building inspector if if you're a homeowner and, and want to put a deck on and you're getting a permit you know if you contact him he'll give you what you need to know about how to properly mount that deck onto your house you know what type of hangers to use um you know he's not just going to sit there and say well get me your blueprints and i'm going to approve or deny your application he'll tell you what you need to do to properly construct um uh, you know a deck or put up a railing um so we do a, a lot of hand holding and that's a lot of the advantage of what we have because we, you know, we have our own code enforcement officer. Um, most communities, you know, you know, probably 245 of the 251 communities just rely on the state to do all of their permitting. We have a code enforcement officer, so that's our that's our plus. And I, I think, and I'm very proud of uh, Audra and Meredith and the job they do at helping staff. So uh, I, I think that's one I would go with. Or to, to, I, I I agree. I think I think that they are great, and I have worked with them as a resident, and they are, as you described, from my experience, um, they make it easy. Uh, Gabe, uh, so I just wanted to to comment. I think it is relevant to the conversation next week. I don't know Kirby if you actually would get called on, but one of the the issues, the only thing that Mike did not concur with us on was the issue about, uh, you know, whether or not we have the right built, you know, the right uh, code to be able to review, do design review as we lift some of the density. And I will tell you that that piece of the AARP report, um, I disagree with. I think Marcella had asked this in one of our other meetings, like what does character of the neighborhood mean? And I think AARP did a good job in highlighting that that's not a good standard. We're putting the DRB in a really bad situation when they have to you know, interpret what character of a neighborhood is and just giving a lot of power to neighbors that don't want to see construction going on. So I think that's a fair point, but the things that they describe are very elitist, right? Like there are modern designs that won't fit the character of the neighborhood as some might interpret it, right? And so if we go in and put really strict rules in about what a facade is going to be or how wide something's going to be, we can really limit housing. And I, I feel like that should just be chucked out. What does it mean? character of the neighborhood like if we want housing in those particular areas where we want to remove density caps I, i'm still totally behind uh removing density caps without any additional uh maybe we need to remove the word character of a neighborhood out of those sections maybe we need to do that but anyway that's just wanted to get that out there yeah i appreciate that and that is something we need to it's something we need to work on it doesn't mean that when we go back and look at design review and make it match up with what we're changing with density that we have to be draconian about it it does need to be it does need to be clear and easily and it's something that's easy to to apply i think that's what you're saying we have some power to do that i think so i think if we do a good job with it maybe we can i like where your head's at though because that's i think it's what's going to have to be in our mind um, John, you're muted. All right. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, maybe some clarification or add to what Mike was commenting on the, um, in terms of the developer boot camp, and, uh, just to clarify that it is not for developers, but it is very much um peter in the spirit of what you were talking about and something the planning commission talked about was that um you know there there are no 
developers coming to save us to build all of our the housing stock that we need and we're going to have to do this ourselves and that we have a lot of smart talented people in the city people who have you know one of those skills that you need to be a successful developer it might be an attorney a, a could be an architect, but they don't think of themselves as developers. And we, we need to do what we can to maybe switch that that thinking or turn on that light and, and then empower them, give them the skills and encouragement and a network that could help them, you know, do their, their pro forma and figure things out and connect them with those people that they may not have as part of their network. And that was the idea behind the, the developers boot camp. And there are, um, people that specialize in doing exactly this. They, they, you know, space them out over time and have these intensive uh, multi-day workshops that people sign up for to, and then are available to, to help them. So I thought, I thought it was just worth mentioning, maybe clarifying a little bit of what Mike was talking about in terms of de developer bootcamp or workshops that it's not targeting existing developers, but, you know, for our community members, who don't necessarily think of themselves as developers, but seeing what we can do so that we can get that uh, incremental development or those those infill projects. I just want to add something. Uh, I can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, by the way, I I agree that Meredith and Audra and Chris do a great job, and I've I've always, I've had great great experiences with all of them. Um, but the missing element is it still costs way too much to do almost any of these projects, particularly like an exterior ADU where you have to put a foundation in and you have to bring in utilities and so forth. Somebody, there needs to be a, a, something more like what you're talking about as a developer um, um, uh, boot camp. There needs to be a, a homeowner boot camp. Where, where, where people are helped to understand. And I really think, I mean, you guys all know about the ADU pilot project that, that we had, which got all, all of what, Mike, six or seven ADUs built? Yeah, it was, uh, the program got interrupted um, a lot because of the, the COVID. And also, unfortunately, you know, it was, it's part of why you have pilot programs. Um, so this was a pilot program that was hopefully trying to go and work with a bunch of funds that actually came uh, as federal funds right. through, through to the municipality. And that is, is what turned out to be the biggest um, disaster of the program. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until we got into it. And at the time when we applied, we were told we wouldn't have to meet these requirements and that we would be able to do all of these things. And then once we got the money and once we got started, they gave us the grant agreement and they said, well, actually you can't do exterior ADUs and you can't do this and you have to get section 109 reports for everything and you have to mitigate all asbestos and lead and you have to go through and test for archeology span and you have to go through. And so you end up spending $15,000 in, order, in order to be eligible to spend and get twenty thousand dollars. So that was, that's why you, that's why you do pilot programs. And the intention was to have a bigger program. So the intent is, once the pilot program is complete, and I believe he has five of the six done. Once the pilot program is complete, and we get a report from Tyler, our intention is to use our housing trust fund and to to look at other funding, go back to city council, and go and explain. This is what we learned. This is how much money it would take. You know, it, there was a lot of interest. We had. Um, more than 50 people contact the city interested in building ADUs. Um, so there's a lot of interest in doing it. And the question is, how do we do it? And this is part of the learning process of going through. But we're not going to jump into developing a new process until we get that report, until we get that final product from Tyler that lets us know how much money do we think owner needs in order to do this? And how? what's the delivery mechanism for getting that money to the homeowner? And um, it's actually two pieces that homeowners need, and that's what Tyler was trying to provide. One piece is education and information, and the other one is money. And so that's what Tyler, that's what this program was supposed to provide, was homeowners want an ADU, but they don't know how to hire a contractor. And so 
that's what the program was supposed to identify is how can we do this and so they they tried a number of ways and and what we'll need to do going forward is to identify the mechanism for how to 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 do these two pieces um and you know at this point tyler was getting paid t entirely out of the federal money so he was providing the, the technical advice now if we do it locally we'd have to figure out how to do that that technical advice piece Okay, but, but, but that is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a program like that, that Audra and Chris and, and Meredith would participate in, but you need somebody like Tyler to carry the ball. And that, again, is one of the reasons why I think we need a housing uh, specialist. But never mind, never mind. But, but Mike, what you just described is exactly what I think is needed. And if we had that, I tell you, we would have 50 or so ADUs built. And the, the quicker we can get that out, I, I, the better. And that's why we did it. And that's why we're doing it. And that's why I supported that it. Was, and and this was mostly on. mostly Kevin's idea of, of how that worked. Kevin and Tyler were the ones who worked that out to make that work. Um, but yes, we're going to try to get through this last piece so we can get that report. So we can try to figure out how we can roll this out and what the costs are going to be to make it, you know, something that that works going forward. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to leave. Well, Peter, Peter, before you go, I do have something for you here. I I put a second link in the chat box. If you could just, you know, click that and save it, uh, save that link. That's to the housing chapter that we're working on. Um, I want you. I gave I gave him permission to the drive, so he's got viewer to the whole drive, so he can see all of them. Okay, I just wanted to give him one directly to it because he's because he has this interest in housing. You know, this is what this is what we've worked on so far. It's not too late to change it, but we have done a lot of work here. Um, since you have an interest in this area, please go through. So this is you know this is the prospective new city plan. This is like new stuff. Uh, if there's something missing there based on you know your assessment let us know and we can revisit and try to because we're you know housing's really serious we don't we don't want to miss any good ideas um but there's a lot of good ideas in there that you might not know is like you know being considered so so you can be aware of what we're planning and the developer boot camp i want to reiterate don't get caught up on the title it's it is a homeowner boot camp it's for people like that. So th this is the revised PC housing template. That, is that that's the one that you just sent? Yeah, I think that's in that is the right one, right, Mike? I tried to go through to make sure. It looked like that is the where we're at with it. It has 21 strategies. You click on the strategies yeah. tab. Yep. Uh, so so yeah, go to the strategies tab to see the good stuff. The like the like what the specific things we're planning to do. Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But, but by the way, let me just ask one, one quick question, because I, I've read the, the former master plan and I've read the famous economic development strategic plan, which I've already told you about. I have concerns about. But there's, there's quite a bit of stuff that is in the old plan that is just wrong. You guys aren't picking language up from it at all, right? Fully. There's there's some continuing stuff from the old plan, but we went through it piece by piece and there's stuff we threw out and then there's lots of new stuff we've added it's um so it's a mix of things because not everything in the old plan was on you know unworthy or you know no no like no no was, I, mean, I mean there's just yeah. fa some things that are factually wrong the things that have changed like transportation the description of the public uh transportation is completely different i hope that will be all updated yeah, yeah that's my all ride updated. in it and so forth hmm. my ride um, yeah Oh, well, I mean, yeah, it's like, uh, and Mike has mostly been the uh, the writer for the the narrative part, which you'll have to go into the folder and find the narr the narrative yeah. part. Like what I sent you wasn't the narrative part, but the the narrative part's all going to be updated. It's not all the way done yet for all these chapters, but yeah, it, the descriptive part will be updated and it will reflect current state. And and w will the growth area be more clearly identified? It's referred to. 50 different times, but there's only one not very clear map of it. There's on the online plan, there's gonna be there's gonna be maps. Like when Mike was talking about the online plan's gonna have a lot of graphics and things, we'll have those maps. So that, I mean, right, Mike? I mean, that's my 
Yeah, we, I mean, we, we still need to develop the land use chapter. That's what the Planning Commission will be developing, and the land use chapter is where we're going to, you know, discuss where our growth center is and where the, you know, where our various, where we have designations and where we would like to have designations. Mike, it would be really great if maps could be consistent across uses if it, you know the master plan, the voting districts, all of the, if there could be overlays for these. But right now, different departments all use different maps from different, different types of maps. And it's very difficult, for example, try to look at the voting district boundaries on, on the, in, that, that is in uh, the city, city clerk's office puts out. You, you can't figure, once you get to downtown, you get lost. Anyway. It'd be great if you could create something where overlays could be used by all the different departments, public works, uh, uh, you know, city council, city council, et cetera. All right, I'm really gonna leave, sorry guys. I've taken up too much of your time. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for the input. Um, okay, uh, that's, that's all the updates. Uh, did we, oh, we had a possible discussion of the AARP senior. I think we went over that. That's just, no. you know, it's not gonna be something that we forget about, something that we'll, we'll circle back to. Um, and so that'll bring us to the appointments for the CVRPC. For the people who weren't here last time, we had a discussion at the beginning of the meeting last time about, uh, making some changes about the CVRPC representation because Marcel has been doing it for a while. It's time to transition that um, she's on a couple of subcommittees on the CVRPC. One of them is the executive committee, which is time consuming. We discussed the possibility of having, right now we have a Marcel as representative and then Mike as the alternate, but Mike serving as the alternate just to fill in if she gets sick or, or whatever. But we're thinking about maybe using those seats differently and having two planning commissioners have those uh, roles and having one planning commissioner who's an alternative who's actually more active and isn't just filling in but actually has some things that they consistently do and then marcella might have some things that she does that's where the discussion was when we left off um marcella do you want to update if that is that evolved at all like are we or is that kind of still what we're thinking of doing um, I don't think it's evolved at all. At least I, I haven't given it uh, a whole lot of further thought. I'm, I'm on the, so I'm on the executive committee, and I'm also on the nominating committee, which is part of like as the executive committee rep, like somebody from the executive committee's got to be on that committee, and that work is just getting going, but would end theoretically around the middle you know in like i don't know may maybe um so but i guess i i'm not sure like how much wiggle room do we have to start having someone else go to the cvrpc meetings before we go to um city council for the official re <laughs> like <laughs> reappointment yeah they wouldn't be there officially <laughs> So they would be on the yeah. yeah, so I actually have an update on that. So uh, it was a little bit of my surprise that they actually appoint them right away, right after town meeting day. So they actually had their appointments last week, last week the council meet. Um, so I mentioned to them that usually these two positions, uh, CVRPC rep and the alternate are usually planning commissioners or, or myself. And so they left it up to you guys to appoint who we want to have as the rep. You guys can vote, and then I'll send a memo to council that says that these are going to be the two, um, the two representatives to CVRPC. So as soon as we make the decision, we can start moving forward with um, the, basically a little bit of division of labor for people who, who missed the last meeting. So the thought was maybe one person would attend the, the general meeting, which meets on the second Tuesdays. Um, and that will let Marcella just do the executive committee. So the, they would basically have two. Um, and if they're both there, Marcella and this, the, the other person were there, then Marcella, because she's the, the lead person, her only, only one vote counts. 
So if you've got more yeah, than right. representative at a meeting, then only Marcella's vote would count. Uh, so my attorney uh, warning bells are kind of going off. Can, do they actually have the power to delegate that to us? Um, yeah, it's just appointments. So a lot of places just have uh, appointments. So they may put it on a, uh, a consent agenda to kind of bless it, but they've already appointed all the other representatives to all the other boards. Okay, yeah, I would feel better if it's on a consent agenda or something, like where it's something where they're doing it. Because I just, I don't know. If someone challenged some action of the CBRPC and discovered that there was some fault with the way that Montpelier does appointments, and I don't know. Sounds like a big mess. But uh, okay, yeah, if it's going to go on a city council consent agenda, then that seems fine. Um, okay, who is interested in sharing? Who is interested in the alternate seat for the CBRPC? Um, I thought it had most, mostly been Gabe. I think Jeff may have followed up in an email, but am I right about that, Gabe? Yeah, I mean, Jeff said that he was available on, on Tuesdays. My thought was, well, if I eventually was going to go into the, the other role, like and be in the exec, executive committee, it would be a good prep like if Marcel is going to stick on for six months or a year and a half or whatever she's going to do um but Jeff jumped right in and said he's got those Tuesdays free so I don't want to you know if he's got the opportunity to help out I think that would be awesome yeah I I would like to I'm so I'm on the nominating committee I would like to nominate myself right off of it right off of all the committees. So if at the July, I think it's the July like fiscal year flip over, if I could just back out entirely at that point, that would be great. But I don't know okay. if that's possible. Jeff, what do you, what do you think? Um, I will, um, I am tentatively available, but less so than when I sent that email. Um, so um, I will defer um, for now. Okay, I don't have it. I can do it. I don't have any conflicts on that that Tuesday. Okay, so uh, the idea is Marcel is going to stay on. But Marcella, just just so we know your preference, you you want to stay on until about July, right? Like it's not like. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I f I would feel kind of awkward ditching off of the things I'm in the middle of now. I okay. mostly just needed like, I mostly just needed like a um, an exit strategy. <laughs> so. Okay, so so that I think that could work as an exit strategy, and then we could just redo the appointments later. Uh, Mike, do you see that being a procedural problem for Marcella to resign from that representation later, even though it wouldn't be, it'd be in the middle of a term, I guess. Um, yeah. I I thought that's what we had done last time, but maybe I'm misremembering that. Yeah, it is kind of funny, the timing, because we appoint right away while the CVRPC usually goes through July, and then the new board starts in August. That was why I thought this, the RPC appointment was later. That's why I told you guys I thought it was going to be in, later in April. Um, but apparently they appoint it right away, which doesn't really overlap well. So I think yeah. I think if we wanted to, I think the, the reality is just Gabe would have to recognize that as Marcella drops off in July, that come August, Gabe's now the the primary CVRPC rep, and then we could have a discussion whether Jeff steps in as um, or whoever is going to step in to be the alternate at that time. Yeah, I mean, that timing actually really works good for me because I just think other commitments that I have, like I can... By July, I can wind some of that stuff down, right? So, you know, I, I think it would, I, I like the idea of having two people though, right? I mean, Marcella, you've been through this. Kirby, you did it. And there's maybe others on here. I mean, just think about the, the burden sharing that goes along. I mean, eight hours a month plus these meetings, you know, I mean, that's, that's quite a bit of volunteer service. Yeah, I think at least the situation that I've gotten myself into now, which perhaps was my fault, but... I mean, it was my fault, but like the, this situation is more than I think, I, more than I am really able to effectively handle. 
by myself. So yes, um, you could probably figure it out where it'd be fine for one person, you know, on the main board and on a committee that meets less regularly, but. Yeah, not, not everybody who's a CVRPC rep is also on a planning commission that meets twice a month. So some of them are appointed completely independently and they hold no other seat. So that's their only responsibility. And some of them are retired. Yeah. So it's, it's a big difference between taking somebody who's, you know, got a job and a family and is already doing two planning commission meetings a month to then, you know, okay, I can do a, a, a general board meeting, but then you start getting pressured to, to do the subcommittees as well. Um, so yeah, I can, it, it does start to add up um, your, your time commitment to it but hopefully as as you said hopefully you know maybe we can do a little bit differently than we have in the past get two people appointed and then you know if something comes up you know then you know maybe Gabe's going to to August and Jeff's going to September and then you know from from a workload standpoint we're starting to divide it out a little bit mm -hmm. I think that sounds good and um, yes a lot of them are retired so this is a it's a this is a good activity to get into if you want to feel young because uh, <laughs> the meetings are skew skew older so Gabe you'll feel like you're a college kid again um, <laughs> so uh, um, okay that sounds like we have a plan so uh, do we have uh, a motion to uh, nominate Marcella and Gabe as uh, Marcella as the primary and Gabe as the alternate for the uh, CVRPC representative from Montpelier. Do we have a motion for that? So moved. Okay, motion from John, do we have a second? I'll second. Second from Marianne. Okay, so uh, those in favor of the motion, is there any discussion, any further discussion? Okay. Those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay. So that's that's our that's our motions passed. Uh, and we can get that to the city council and um, effective immediately we can start operating that way. So uh, Gabe, are you aware of when the next CVRPC meeting is? April 12th. Marcel, will you get me like a link or something? Or where do yeah, I Yeah, I'll hold on. I'm pulling it up on my calendar too. I will um, send a note to Bonnie to let her know what's what. Are those virtual, by the way? I guess I should have asked that. They're virtual, yeah. Okay, okay. good. Yeah, it is the 12th, 6.30. Very good. Um, okay, yeah, and, and if Bonnie needs something from Mike or I, just let okay. us know. Okay, great. Thank you, and I appreciate everybody's willingness to help out. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for, for doing that. I know it's, I know it's draining and thankless, so. Thank you. Well, I've, I've learned now not to get myself roped into too many of the big things. <laughs> but it's man, it's tough. tough. The peer pressure is real. It's like, talk about feeling like you're in high school again. It's like, well, we've all done it before and there's three people in the room and it's like, Marcella, <laughs> it's going to be you, right? Yeah. And I'm like, well. <laughs> they they definitely tried to pressure me, but I, I got to say, I, I was more heartless. I was just like, well, nah. That's good. Nah. <laughs> this is a good skill to learn. Good skill to learn. Yeah. I was like, I'll, okay, I'll be on your Brownfields committee that meets once every 10 years. I'll do that for you. Um, okay. Uh, that's great. Good to know we're moving along there. Uh, and then, so, that, so the next thing we have to do is approve the goals and strategies for economic development. Have we not done that? Or, uh, I, I guess we haven't approved the strategies. You know, we uh, didn't quite get to the end of it, and we, yeah. we ended it, and it's good that John's on here because we had this one bit of discussion about the vacant lands and taxing, and uh, I think we just, like, it was 7.30, so we just shut it down. But I don't know if anybody else did some reading. I, 
it seems like like Oakland, there's some other cities that have done this and uh, you know, they'll pour any money into like a fund, you know, like low income housing fund or something for underutilized properties. Kirby, you seem to think like the city couldn't have its own tax because that's what it looks like most of these municipalities have done is they've created their own tax. Um, no, um, not the, the, uh, the way that the Vermont works. Um, cities don't have the authority to create laws. They have to follow st whatever the state allows. Um, uh, you know, we, we have to do charter changes for a lot of things, and that means legislative approval. As far as the tax side of this goes, uh, I, I just, I'll put on my, like, tax attorney hat for a second. Like, um, supposedly, like, like, so, so the idea of, of land that's vacant, like a parking lot in downtown Montpelier, the sitting vacant, the way that the Vermont system, as it stands, would try to capture that value is that our uh, Montpelier has an assessor uh, who's, who's on staff for most towns, it's a lister, uh, will value it based on its highest and best use. So that parking lot would be valued, not necessarily as a parking lot, it's supposed to be valued as its highest and best use. It's still vacant land though but it would be vacant land and like how, like it wouldn't be like, it, it would be based on the value of how could this be used? And I would think the assessor would value it based on basically it should be used as office, an office property or commercial space or something like that, that would have a higher value. Um, Are we doing that? That would seem like a huge incentive. It's, but, it, but, but I, I, I'm, they're gonna, what they're going to do, I think, is like they're going to take the land. There's going to be a land schedule for the downtown, and whatever, and and so there wouldn't be a building to value, and they're just going to take that land schedule, which is going to be probably pretty high as far as vacant land goes. But it's yeah, but it's not going to represent a building, um, and that's what John's pointing out is. It'd be nice to to tax them as if there was a building, so then there would be less incentive to not have a building. Is that right, John? Yeah, I mean, the, basically, right now, like we had a case where we had some homes torn down, and their tax bill goes down. So we're incentivizing. We are not incentivizing investment in our community. And that's all for the same. It's not like our services went down when they tore that down, right? So the cost of our services should be exactly the same. And the marginal increase of adding, you know, homes or businesses is, is um, not necessarily that high, but our tax structure is completely unrelated. Therefore, if we had a way uh, to focus just on the, the land value, land value taxes, essentially the, the concept that people have been exploring, then you have some predictability in terms of when you're investing of what your taxes, you know, will be, and you don't have that, disin you're incentivized to invest as much as possible in your property. There are obviously a lot of challenges and it needs to be rolled out very thoughtfully and making sure people are enabled and have the resources to invest in their, their properties. But, um, the idea that we could set stuff up not to disincentivize uh, investing in areas that we would like to see de development. Obviously, you would not want to do this in places where you do not want development. But, you know, um, I just look at like the, the growth, like, you know, whatever that growth map is, right? If you look at that, it's not just the downtown, right? It's more expansive than that. And you have people, and if they're, if we're not assessing them properly, right, people are just, there's, there's a lot of parcels out there that are underutilized. And it sounds like buildings too. I've seen some buildings that are really underutilized. Well, they should be taxed appropriately, right? With the best uses. And I, maybe it's just, an, maybe we just need to do it. <laughs> it sounds like if that's already on the books and it's just not being done, maybe we just need our assessor to make sure that as they go through this next round of uh, the, 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 the assessor is doing it correctly. And and the the way that the property assessment's done is is because we have the statewide education property tax because you know we have the state property tax to pay for schools 
there's it's state law strictly controls how assessment is supposed to be done be, because so the towns can't play games and you know contribute less to the education fund than other towns so it's it's there's not really any wiggle room for doing anything differently um there have been but, some go ahead john I was just going to say, you know, there's been legislation introduced, and in, I, I don't know where it is at, the, at this point, but to have pilot communities do this. So I think, I don't know if as a strategy, we don't need to like figure out all the details, but simply say that, you know, we'll, we are, would like to move forward in exploring any opportunities to shift our, our taxing, um, structure and practices so that they incentivize more investment in these areas in our, our growth areas. And then if there is a pilot community, an opportunity or a pilot community that gets passed, you know, we're in a, a place where we've already identified this is something we'd like to, to do as a community. Yeah, I think that sounds like a fun strategy. Yeah, and I in the in the plan it's pretty um pretty much says that you know it says there's been an idea discussed for a few years about implementing a land value taxation formula in order to assess higher property tax scheme for vacant land and buildings in the montpelier growth center this has not been fully examined and should be considered so that's the the description of the strategy to study alternatives to the current property tax system so we're not going to be getting into in this plan exactly what that's going to look like, but you know there are pluses and minuses that we should be looking at um, in that system. I mean, housing is front and center, so who knows? You know, this could be there could be, you know, there could be a pilot that comes out and and just making. I it's it's not committal, right? We're just saying we'd like to explore. I think it should stay in. I, I like. It. I know Kirby, you just. You felt like it, there there was no wiggle room, but who knows what could what could come in the future? No, I mean I'm 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 not opposed to the idea. I just um, I have I have biases because I like I work in property tax policy a lot yeah. and get used to a certain way of thinking about it, and this is different than that. But if the state law changed, then as a matter of policy. Uh, not against anything about it. Yeah, I just think there, there are pluses and minuses. I think there are challenges to doing it, but um, I think as, as John points out, you know, there, there, there are advantages to, to that system. You know, the current system has its checks and balances. We'd have to just see how the checks and balances would work in the other system. Um, you know, the checks and balances of our current property valuation system is that you can check it against the the, the sales record and that's how you get the the CLA and the COD for the you know current level of assessment and the coefficient of dispersion which kind of gives you an idea of how good you're doing because the idea is it's, it's the value of your property and if people are selling properties then you should be able to go through and compare what was it assessed for and what did it sell for and that's how you get these CODs and CL CLAs that judges how good your assessor is doing. Um, you know, this other valuation system, we would have to see what, what are the checks and balances in that system because it's now separated from what its sale value is. So how do we make sure that, you know, um, a land value tax system in Barry City is valuing things appropriately compared to Montpelier? And I think those are the, the questions we'd have to hear from an expert on how, how those work to make sure that we are, as, as Kirby points out, sending our appropriate amount of money to the state. Um, over time so, so yeah so state law changed i mean it would be a municipal version of this so it, so i think if like, i don't think the state legislature would do anything that's going to drastically change how ed funding works i just feel like it would mm -hmm. be such a big change and like scary for them i just but if but if it's allowing municipalities to like do a municipal tax that's not affecting education tax, oh yeah do municipal tax as opposed yeah. to the education Edu you'd have two, yeah. two then, valuations then maybe, to your property yeah yeah because i think that's how it would be done if it were done yeah um 
yeah, state law changes. Maybe we, yeah, we have a strategy in there to jump on it. And if there's a pilot, have Montpelier try it. Yeah, I know the mayor is in support of this idea. Just, just to say, there, there, you know, this is this is an idea that has been out there and has been talked about. And I know the mayor has has been interested in hearing more about this. There might be other things, uh, other possibilities. It's it's not exactly this, but just some get, getting a maybe maybe it would be a charter change thing, but just. Uh, like a, if we had a fee for undeveloped land within the uh, within the growth center, you know, if we could, if like I, th I feel like there there are other things too that maybe maybe wouldn't require like a state law thing. It would just require a charter change. I don't know. What do you think about like basically like like taxing or making it you know dis disincentivizing undeveloped land in the growth center john um but in a different way yeah anything you know and i'd i prefer maybe framing it in incentivizing people to do the right thing as opposed to yeah to telling people that you're going to tax them more but um but whatever that, whatever shape that takes, you know, if it's if it's some kind of vacant um, vacant building um, fee, or there's a number of different ways you can do this. Yeah, that could be something to um, investigate. A, we could have a strategy, become a development strategy to have um, someone at the city, I don't, you know, do a, um, a study might be too big of a word, but some to have to have some staff like look into what would need to be done to have a, a, a fee or something similar at the city level just to do. There's just to be some economic or I think there's, there's enough there's cities that that have done it that we could you know benchmark off and see but it sounds like either way either there's you know there's some there's there's some kind of legal change that has to happen at the state level right either a charter change or yeah it's just, there's just legal work involving vermont law specifically here yeah, you know on how you're targeting it if you're targeting it as as a property ta tax or some kind of tax change then yeah that's going to require that but other things like vacant buildings we can assess vacant building fees um, separately. We already have the authority to do that. Um, okay, we, that's good to know. We, Barry City did it. When I was there, I, I drafted their vacant building. What about vacant land? Uh, wasn't about vacant land. Theirs was about public safety. Um, this was, you know, I got there in 2008 in Barry City. 2009 was the market crash, and suddenly, you know, 30, 40, 50 vacant houses were all over the place. And so, lawns weren't getting mowed, things weren't being kept up. So there was a vacant building fee, which actually I think was zero for a while, but had um, had penalties that if you failed to meet these standards, then we would send these fines to to them. And it had mixed results. Sometimes they were very successful, sometimes they weren't. And actually, surprisingly, it was the, the foreclosed properties owned by banks far away that were actually the easiest ones to deal with because we could just send them a note and they would either send somebody out from property maintenance and fix it or they'd send us a check for 500 bucks we'd be like score um and we'll send you another letter in two weeks when you haven't mowed the lawn again so um it was yeah we we already have the authority to do some pieces and so if you talk about fees and things we have those opportunities i think the question is going to be is uh, is that where our priorities, when we look at staff time and priorities and, and when we get to that that level of, you know, we've got our ideas here, now we've got to kind of have those discussions of what are our higher priorities and what are our lower priorities. Um, um, you know, in certain towns, these, this is a big, big issue. Um, in Montpelier, I don't, you know, most of our vacant buildings are owned by, you know, one or two people and I don't know. I don't know how to change that. 
Um, but we have a number of vacant properties that are owned by banks and or or are in legal limbo. We've helped get a couple out um, and get them moved on, but others are still stuck. It's it's amazing how many of them are stuck because somebody has passed away, nobody inherited it, and it's sitting in limbo. Um, and we just got to get around to, you know, waiting till the banks give it up, and sometimes the banks don't. So we've got a couple of those. If you're driving like down River Street, you're like, why hasn't anyone ever done anything with that building that's just falling into the ground? It's it's legally bound up. There's there was one on Charles Street that was stuck for years. There's another one out on Elm Street. Um, it's it's amazing how things get stuck. So I need to get somebody who owns a building in Montpelier to adopt me. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Apparently there's, there's free buildings that we don't know what to do with. You just got to inherit the, you know, it's, it was amazing. So, you know, the one, um, that modern looking building on River Street just past Dunkin' Donuts, if you were kind of heading out towards, or actually it's not River Street over in that, it's still part, it's still um, Berlin Street. Dunkin' Donuts is still Berlin Street. But that modern looking building that weighed, um, Ward Joyce built that was on a property that was bound up in in legal issues that we were able to work with the 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 the, the courts and stuff to get it get it out so we could get it sold so they could basically tear down the building and redevelop that site but we haven't really had the resources to go and attack that as much as you know we kind of hope that with the housing prices what they are that housing developers will kind of do some some on their own to try to Un, unjam these properties. So I think like what you're indirectly saying is that even if there's some sort of like carrot or stick involved, it's not going to affect these situations because it's just tied up and it depends where it is. It's in the growth stuff. center. If it's in the growth center, I mean, I, I think I've been surprised in some cases, you know, I was, you know, I was uh, giving the negative you know, of the vacant building ordinance. I, I didn't think it was going to be effective the way they put it together, but it was primarily targeted towards getting the, um, next to the Econo Lodge, that building torn down, that vacant restaurant building. And much to my surprise, they contacted the property owner and they tore it down. So um, I'm, I've, I've learned to, I have my thoughts of where I think things will go, but not, it doesn't always work out that way. So maybe a new fee on that building on some of those vacant buildings, you know, and contacting the banks that own them will give them an incentive to, you know, more of an incentive to move those forward and get them back. You know, and some of the reading on this, I, I wasn't quite expert, you know, in, in what John was talking about, but just trying to understand what other communities have done. Just the idea of identifying them, there's this sort of, like shaming type thing that happens where people don't want to be the derelict building the, the, you know like these are like you say there's probably like two or three landlords that own most of the stuff that we're talking about they don't want to be identified as people that are holding up housing and it's amazing what happens in these communities who do these things that all of a sudden they start getting traction right just interesting yeah Ver, you know, Vermont has a uh, delinquent taxpayer list, by the way, you can look up talking about public shaming. Like the whole reason that exists is to shame people into paying their taxes. We could do an underutilized property map. Um, and there's a number of different ways to do that. I think I think Burlington did create that in their last city plan, but it, could do it as a combination of property value and then a number of other factors based on floor area ratio and you don't want to yeah yeah anyway so that's just something we could probably do fairly easily you know without changing state tax law yeah and that doesn't necessarily have to that's just information I mean, you can do that just to get information and then figure out what we do, you know, what do we do in response to it. Um, so, yeah, that would be good information to have. So what do we want to, what do we want to put down as strategies out of all these various possibilities? What, what number are you looking at right now, Gabe? 
because I'm I'm not sure what number we were on. Eighteen. One line. Eighteen. Okay. Uh, so the alternatives to that system. So do we, do we want to keep this as is, or do we do we want to add another strategy along the lines of what we're talking about now, or or add to this? Do we want to add the the map idea, or? I think we should add that. I think the rest of it, what we talked about, is sort of captured in the exploring the ideas, right? But that that's kind of a new idea. Put a map of underutilized properties in the growth district. Okay. Um, I'll, I'm going to leave that to you, Mike, to if you want to create a new strategy for that or, or add it to this one. I'd probably just add, add a new one in there. Oh, got two computers going here. I'll just put a note of it for now and we'll fill it in later. Okay. Okay, yeah, let's go through the rest of these strategies. There's, uh, yeah, I thought we made it farther than, than this, but. Uh, we got mostly through the list. We just had a couple I that hadn't that. been approved. Yeah, I wish I would have left a note of what number we left off on. I think we actually got through all of them. That was the only one that was hanging us up. Is that what everybody else remembers? We just didn't have time to vote it out or anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because we made it through TIFF, Streetscape. No, Hotel and Parking Garage we talked about. That's the last one. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we were just missing a few folks, so we wanted to make sure we, especially John had been involved in so much of this. Okay. So, before we, before we vote on these as our strategies, um, does everybody want to take take a minute to to go through them to make sure that they're good with it? Do you need a, Do you need a minute, John? I don't think so. I think you know the only place I had questions around the goal and strategy was around workforce development and whether or not that was appropriate at the city level and if that was just taking away from maybe our other priorities around housing but i think we also maybe talked about this and i don't want to rehash yeah we talked about it we talked about this last week and there are existing there's some existing um re, like there's there's a lot of existing workforce training resources out there with like uh, the community college and many other places and the city's role would be just to have our staff connect people with those things. So that the, the idea of, of the city just being a part, like uh, an entity that connects people to those things is what that goal is about. That's my recollection anyway of our conversation. It just seems kind of odd. Like, I don't know, I'm not gonna go to who goes to like the city to figure out any of these things? I, I, I kind of I agree, but Mike said that there's people who have done that. Like it's happened. Uh, honestly, I feel like it's just by having it in there, it's just showing that we're as a city we're not neglecting this as a need or trying to abdicate the city's, you know, responsibility to help the citizens in, in this area. Um, so it's kind of symbolic in my mind. Um, we did talk about things like housing and childcare that the city can do stuff about that makes a big impact on economic development. And we want to have strategies on the, in the online version of the plan. We want to have strategies for housing and for the, like childcare is going to be in uh, community services, I think chapter, we want to have like links 
from this chapter to those things as well. And acknowledge the connection, economic development connection. Do we have any other comments about this, the current state of the chapter, the, the goals and strategies? And I'm not trying to be dismissive of like what, what John said about the goals either, if, if, if people feel like they want to remove that. Is there interest in removing that goal or? Okay, so not not hearing not hearing interest in removing that goal. I, I'm interested so, in it, but yeah, I know you're, the, you're interested in it. I could go either. Activity. I could go either way. Um, yeah. I could go either way. I, I think the only way that really comes comes out and and works is the community services department is already interested because we don't use the word hub enough. We've got the hub for the Elks Club, who's interested in the recreation. We've got the our Arc GIS hub. And we also, um, there was also an interest separately in having a um, community services hub. And that was gonna be something the community services department was gonna run in the downtown. It was to, meant to really kind of start to work with um, some social and economic justice, some homelessness, how do we connect people to services? And if that, we're not sure if that's gonna go anywhere but if it does that might be the opportunity where something like a workforce development person you know if you were going to have somebody that was going to connect people to resources that's probably where it would be implemented and and not through say my office as the community and economic development specialist wouldn't be working on this but it would be in conjunction with that but i don't i don't see us probably doing an economic development officer in that way um, unless it's part of that hub, community services hub. So we have we have one goal and one strategy related to this. Um, I think uh, one thing we could do, if we could keep it in there as a possibility, like what Mike's saying, we can move it down though. We can make it instead of, to, to the extent that people see things like ranked and of importance, we could move it down to the, the last goal instead of being what right now it looks like the number one goal. People, or is yeah, that I even going to? I think that makes sense to move it down if we're going to keep it in there. Okay. And then, yeah, I mean, and on the online version, there still will be a list, so it will be relevant, right? Like the order in which these things are listed. Yeah, the, the order doesn't matter. Um, there's it's just the order is usually tied to what's listed in the aspiration. The aspiration lays out a number of things and then they're broken into yeah. the goals and then broken into the so it just depends on where yeah. in the list of the aspiration. So 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 we'll have to move we would have to move this down to number two, goal number two, because there's only two goals under the first aspiration. So instead of goal number one, it would be goal number two. So yeah, is that okay, Mike, to do that? Yeah, which I'll just I'll That's shuffle. What people are interested. Yeah, so people are interested in that. Uh, so let's do that at least to de-emphasize it a little bit. Uh, is there anything else people have comments or feedback about? Does that mean we're ready to vote? Vote it out. And again, nothing is permanent. This is how it's going to start getting moved into the online version. And then when the public sees it, we will make more adjustments. Okay. Well, do we have a, a motion to uh, approve the goals and strategies for the economic development chapter as discussed? I so uh, move. Oh, I second. Either one, <laughs> all first or second. No. We have a motion from Marcel and a second from Gabe. Any further discussion? Those in favor of approving the goals and strategies, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So we've made it through that. 
And we don't have the chat for language yet. Is that correct, Mike? Nope. Not ready. Okay. So he's he's been buried. Um, totally understandable. Uh, which means that uh, all we have left is to approve the minutes from the two February meetings. So people can take a look at those real quick. And when you're ready, move to approve them or change them. When people are ready, I, I move to accept the minutes as provided. Did we... Uh... This, the second set of minutes is reminding me, uh, we discussed doing tax stabilization for child care businesses. That's not in the economic development chapter though, is it? We're, we're, that'll, that'll be a, a strategy that we talked about for uh, a different chapter, the services chapter. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, but I believe it, it, it um, which is number seven in that list, it goes through the tax stabilization program is an economic development program, blah, 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 blah. And we added a sentence on the end, child care and commercial housing projects should be given special consideration under these rules. Cool. Okay. Thanks for the reminder. But yes, it will we, also, we, when we talk about child care under community services, we'll also have that same strategy. We'll you know, when it's online, it'll all be just one thing with links to the other ones, but. Okay, so uh, do we have a second for approving the minutes? Okay, move to approve. I'll second. A second from Jeff. Does anybody need more time? Those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thanks. The only thing left on the agenda is to adjourn, but uh, does anybody have like any more announcements or anything, or do you want to so for, for next time at the meeting, we uh, will cover the economic development chapter language. Do you think, do you think do you'll have that, Mike? I'm still, I'll be trying as much as I can to get, um, to get, to get going on that. Um, okay. I started um, it, but wasn't really able to get through it, but I will um, if you, put that on the top of the list again. Okay. If you, if you want to do like, I don't, I don't mind helping out. If you want to like throw in like your, your thoughts, like in an outline or some bullets or something, and I can, I'll, I can flush it out if that'll help you. Uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I've got, sometimes it's just a matter of getting a couple hours without okay. being in job interviews and what, uh, do we, do we have uh, any goals or strategies lined up or did you have thoughts about which one? Like, um, so I've got the community services is being worked on. Dan, our, my intern, he's working with Cameron on the community services. So we'll have most of those chapters um, in May. So we're still a little bit out on that one. So really, yeah, economic development would be the top one. Um, the other possibility is I can get through the utilities and facilities, um, which is mostly done. Um, I just got to finalize a couple of pieces, and I think we could get that okay. implementation strategy out. Um, not very glamorous, not very exciting, but, you know, it's one of the other required pieces that we've got to get through. So, but sure. We want to try to focus on getting the economic development chapter done. Okay, so let's 
So we're tentatively going to plan to get the economic development chapter done. Uh, we can have utilities possibly as something to start on. Um, and and if yeah, if you need uh, if yeah, if you're not able to, I mean, there's there's we could we could do arts and culture because we have some stuff for that. We'll be doing that from scratch anyway. Uh, and if all fails there, then we can have our. I kind of don't want to do the the CNU AARP uh, discussion until we get the city council vote on the related things, but that could be a backup too. We could start okay. fleshing out. We also can just start fleshing out what we want to start to do with the land use because we've got most of the pieces we need for land use. Um, you know, community services won't affect land use that much. Public safety isn't going to affect land use. Um, utilities and facilities to a, to a smaller degree, but we can start having just some, you know, start framing out our discussions of land use and where we want to go. What, you know, what do we do? What, what do we already have in our plan? What are we talking about? How are we doing this? You know, really start to have some thoughts on, you know, getting back to our little bit of our maintain, evolve, transform. What are the what are the places that we're trying to keep the same? What are the places that we need to change a little bit? What are the places we we're going to need to transform? Because <clears throat> we're going to really the land use plan isn't meant to be really detailed. Um, it's not meant to be detailed like a zoning map is that that's really down. We're we're trying to work on um, some general. Um, direction for the various neighborhoods in the city and you know maybe just you know if i can pull together a neighborhood map we can start pulling together what what we might want to try to do in these various areas um it's is one that really does need a lot of public input but it, at a certain point we've got to put together the first map to let them start you know give them something to respond to basically. okay yeah so i was thinking i was thinking that was going to be like work intensive for you to get that going so that's why i didn't think of really going there, but are it you, would be more are you work intensive, of, but hmm? it would be it a little be. bit more work intensive, but I was trying to think yeah. just having a conversation um, and, and just starting to have a discussion between us, it'll make it easier for me to, to develop it later on if I've got some notes as to where you guys think we should be going um, rather than having mm -hmm. the first draft and have you guys then kind of beat it up for a bit it'll give us a little bit of an opportunity to kind of develop it at at it at the roots um and build it build it up from there which as you guys have seen doing economic development takes a little bit longer to do when you're the one you know you're not responding to somebody else's economic development plan you guys are trying to build it and that means we're throwing stuff in and taking stuff out along the way um okay so if everybody could just think about like uh, the land use chapter and what you think will be important to uh, focus on for us. If you need help, like if it's, if that seems too abstract, you should, you, you could take a, the, a look at the current city plan and look at the land use chapter there to know kind of like to get the gist of what, what it's about. But um, so we'll plan to possibly have that discussion in the future, though. So if people can start thinking about it, that, it'll be helpful. OK, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. OK, John, move to adjourn. Do we have, does John have a second? Second. Second from Gabe. All right. Uh, those in favor of uh, adjourning. Hi. See you. Hi. Bye. Bye. Oh, bye. All right. You guys have a good night. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye. Bye.